Cheers. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, that's enough. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to point out that was Jeanette's choice of it our walking on music. It was, it was my fault, 30 seconds. Um, hello, everybody, um, and welcome to tonight's event. Um, this inaugurates our new Solstice and Equinox um, event series. Um, my name is John McAuliffe. I know a bunch of you here, um, and it's great to see lots of new faces as well. I'm the director of the University of Manchester's Creative Manchester Research Platform, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that before we get started. In my role as director, I have the lovely job of working with researchers across the university in many disciplines, seeing how we get to jigsaw together the enormous amount of world-leading research being done in a way that will bring about further new discovery. And it's great to see a bunch of those researchers in different rows of the audience here tonight. Researchers all around the university's three faculties love and are proud of our cultural institutions. We often take them uh, for meetings at these venues, at Jodrell Bank, at the Whitworth Art Gallery, at the Manchester Museum, or here at the John Rylands Research Institute and Library. Each of these great Manchester institutions has a long history of showcasing and hosting new work. And they're also a proving ground for brilliant inventors and brilliant teachers and collaborative teams. These are spaces where, as the Irish poet Derek Mahan says, a thought can grow. And that's why we'll be running these quarterly events, beginning tonight with my colleague, Professor Jeanette Winterson, who will be followed by Professor David Olashoga in March at the, at the uh, Manchester Museum. And that will be followed by an event on June 21st at the Meridian um, First Light Pavilion in Jodrell Bank. I am reminded um, to tell you now as well that you can sign up for our newsletter at the Creative Manchester website for news of this and all of our other events. Tonight though, and um, thanks to the team here um, at the John Rhinans Research Institute and Library, hello Hannah, um, and Christopher Presler as well, I'm very happy that Jeanette has traveled up from her home in snowy Gloucestershire. And I saw photographs of the deep snow and the minus 10 conditions which she um, left the Cotswolds in um, uh, this morning. She's going to be um, reading to us. Um, and welcome also to those of us who are joining us on the, on the live stream um, as well. And she's going to be reading for you as well. Um, and I also want to say, I suppose, that Jeanette has been making this journey from the Cotswolds up for 10 years now. Jeanette, I was looking at it. I know this is going to be, this next semester is going to be Jeanette's 10th year um, here in Manchester. It has been a privilege to work alongside her um, and to talk to her about poetry and politics and people as we do every time um, we're together on the corridor at the Centre for New Writing. Our students love working with Jeanette. And she's also been not just an inspiration, but a supporter and a prompter for writers, someone whose own work is exemplary, but who is also a brilliant and generous connector to the publishing world for our students. Like many people, my first experience of Jeanette's work was reading her astonishing first novel, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, and I have loved keeping up with her work and seeing how her crystal clear tone, her joy in play and her playfulness, her ability to communicate ideas and passion are as present in her historical fictions, in her memoirs, um, in the more speculative and fantastical work which most recently appeared in Frankenstein and in her essays in 12 Bites and in the stories she collected in this book. And I also have a really beautiful edition of this book, um, Christmas Stories. It's typical of Jeanette as well that when we started talking about tonight, she immediately responded that of course she'd like to do the event. But she also nominated a charity that we might work with. As you might remember from Eventbrite, Manchester Youth Zone works with young people and children in the most deprived areas of North Manchester, offering development activities and meals to their community. Um, Manchester Youth Zone had been planning to be here tonight as well and to speak about their work, but they are so short-staffed that all hands have been put to work in the centre tonight. There is, if you go back to the Eventbrite link, and I encourage you to do so, um, a, just give, a total giving page, um, and I know they would really appreciate any donations that you can make um, through that link tonight. So, 
Um, the format for tonight's event is that I'm going to ask Jeanette a few um, questions to begin with, to warm up. Um, we might reach out into the audience. I know everybody loves a little bit of audience participation, don't you? Yeah? Um, and uh, we'll maybe talk about a couple of poems as well. Um, and then we're going to break, and we will, what I'm look, most looking forward to, hear Jeanette um, read one of her Christmas stories. And there'll be time at the end as well for people who have comments and questions for us. So that's it. I'm going to sit right down here. Jeanette, how are you? Oh, I'm so glad to be here. You know, it feels like, for me, this, tonight's going to be the beginning of Christmas, yeah. isn't it? So whatever you've got, all, all your troubles, things you haven't wrapped, things you haven't done, don't worry. You know, things we haven't wrapped, you're getting way ahead of me. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just, we, we're going to start tonight, aren't we? So I thought maybe, though, that like, this is this Christmas, and we're delighted you're here, but I thought I might ask you a little bit about Christmas's past, and if you could talk a little bit about, because it's been, you know, you write about it brilliantly in this book, but if you could talk us, talk us maybe a little bit about a couple of what Christmas has meant to you. Because it was a beacon, I think. It was a beacon. And I, I think what happens to you in your childhood really defines your Christmases and your experience of Christmas. And either you have to reject that, because it was so goddamn awful, mm. and make your own, or there was some fairy dust around it, and it's something that you cherish. And I think for me, my mother, Mrs. Winterson, was a very unhappy woman. Mm. Um, that's my uh, adoptive mother, Mrs. Winterson. The battle between us was actually between happiness and unhappiness, because... And I was blessed with a cheerful temperament. God knows where it came from. <laughs> and this, but anyway, it used to drive her mad. But at Christmas, for the 12th, something changed, something miraculous used to happen. It was the only time of the year when she was, she was actually happy. Mm. She used to play the piano, she played Judy Garland. Um, on the piano, sing along, have yourself a merry little Christmas. Uh, there were always carols being bashed out. You know, they, it was an old-fashioned way of playing the piano in the 1960s. You know, because it, it really depended on not moving your wrists at all mm. and thrashing out the chords so that no note was exempt. You know, the entire <laughs> piano was covered. Um, so no, no, nobody felt left out, none of the black keys or anything, top to bottom. So she'd bash out the carols, you know, with lots of octave frills and trills, and we'd all sing along. And... It, it was, she was at that point welcoming, unless the Salvation Army came round, and if they knocked on the door to sing carol, she'd say, Jesus is here, go away, oh. <laughs> slam. But it, it was, for me, it was, it was exciting because, you know, there were the paper chains that you had in Manchester in those days, Accrington Wells, that went from the centre, you know, the light in the centre of the ceiling to the four corners, yeah. you all had that, the Christmas tree on top of the television, not a real one, as many baubles as you could possibly put on it, all of that. And so it became to me a place that was warm, which our house never mm. was, where there was enough food, which there never was, mm. and where this larger-than-life person that uh, was my mother, I think, I mean, I used to think, looking, is that my mother, um, was happy, and that made such a difference. So for me, then, always coming up to this period even if I don't want to be happy, even mm. if I'm physically resisting it for some reason, I'm magnetically drawn towards generally cheering up and playing stuff like Mariah Carey and yeah. Wham and Slade. <laughs> and I just can't help myself. If you saw my kitchen tonight in the Cotswolds, you would see that the whole... I don't have a tree because the cats always pull it over. Mm. Um, and in fact, when I was young, our cat Tibbles got electrocuted because she chewed through the, uh, the light. And these were, these were like wartime lights, I think. So poor Tibbles, all the fair stood, and, and that was the end of that. So I've stopped doing trees, but I decorate all the beams in my house um, uh -huh. uh, because there's lots of beams and everything has something hanging from it. And there are lights everywhere. I mean, I look like a carvery. <laughs> you came down my lane, you'd say, oh, shall we stop there and get a burger? And actually, it's me, because the whole fence is lit up, uh, the garage is lit up like a Swiss chalet, uh, there's flashing lights in the apple trees out the front. There's nobody on this road except me. Mm. So you really know when you've arrived. Um, so that's, I suppose, how it began and how it has continued. And I'm not prepared to let it go. So when, uh, there's no Grinches here tonight, are there? No, very wise. I don't want to be that. I want to be... It's the Charles Dickens thing as well, isn't it, with the Christmas yeah. carol? You want, you want to, in this season, open your heart, reflect on the past, be in the present, and be ready for the future, for what comes next. Mm. It's, as, as well as all those things that we think about from our childhood, it is for us as adults now, I think, 
a genuine time of contemplation and reflection where you can move out of the ordinary uh, linear workings of the everyday yeah. world and you can move into significant time, time that's not clock-bound yeah. or calendar-bound. And that's why we go back to read the classics that we do, the poems yeah. that we do, even you know our favourite films, whatever it is, whether it's Meet Me in St. Louis, Judy Garland, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, whatever it is, It's a Wonderful Life, whatever it is, Muppets Christmas Carol. Uh. We go to these places because we <laughs> want to come out, um, really, of the everyday linear world and into something else which is meaningful to us, I think. Like one of the things you talk about in the book is that as, as a festival of light and darkness, which this yeah. is a more as much as, or more so even, than it being a Christian festival, and you talk about, about that. And that that's I think it is, isn't it? I mean, because it's a Celtic festival originally, you know, yeah, I mean, look, you must have been raised Catholic, mustn't you? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and you, yeah. Know, you know how brilliant the Catholic Church have always been about appropriating other people's stuff, mm. and then saying, well, we'll make this into a festival of our own. Yeah. And they were always good at that. So thinking, oh, here we are, you know, in Britain, they're all pagans, they're all Celts, what should we do? Um, setting it all up to work uh, around this idea of festivals of light, around mm. the solstice, you know, it's a really smart move, isn't it? It really is. But it also means that whether you're, you've been brought up as a Christian, whether you've been brought up in another tradition, it makes absolutely no difference. You know, the Jews at the moment are celebrating Hanukkah. Mm. And we are in a place where we know that we're heading for, really, the shortest day, and we're moving back into... Uh, the period of light that we all look towards oh, and I'm everyone thinking. can appreciate yeah. that. Whether you, you, you're very religious or you're not religious at all, the idea of the, the, the dying of the light and then the returning of the light, mm. that's so ancient, isn't it? Well, there, is, there are those continuities. Like uh, one of Because I talk to my children now about my Christmas and I, I sound like I'm the ancient mariner sometimes <laughs> because, you know, we used to have the Rand boys and the mummers and we used to go, we used to go from house to house playing instruments and... Uh, which we couldn't play, and we would, you know, just go around with tin whistles and um, singing songs and singing a penny for the ran. And there would be the, in in when I was smaller, even there was the Christmas hunt and things where the gentry mm. would go out in the fields um, around us. And it does feel a million, like it really does, feel, and it feels like a million miles away fr from from this world, except that, is, as you say, that sense of community and that sense of an oasis away from the workaday world when the family mm. is all in the house together in daylight um, rather than people just meeting at night. Um, yeah. And perhaps people eating together. Yeah. What do you, like, that, can you think of things that, you, that used to happen that no longer happen though? Are there parts of that kind of childhood Christmas? Oh, but mine was very religious, so all of yeah. that's gone. So, you know, yeah. it was setting up the rival carol service with the Salvation Army. You know, you could, you, <laughs> you know, always singing a different carol to them. Yeah. Um, I mean, my parents were very competitive, really, for Christians. I mean, you're not supposed uh. to be, are you? You're just meant to be meek and mild, but no. Um, so it was all, all, for us, it was very religious-based. But underneath all of that, uh, the, in the church, the crib in the manger and all the rest mm. of it, and there was something else which always went deeper, which was a sense of solitude, which, strangely enough, Christmas is about. I mean, yeah. everybody worries about, oh, people are going to be on their own. Uh, what, well, I mean, oh, I love spending Christmas on my own. If I can get it, I'm taking it. Because of that sense of solitude that you can have sometimes, which sits underneath all of the, the visiting relatives, the friends, the, just the busyness. Mm -hmm. And you get back to the, that other space, which, yeah. again, about this significant time. Well, it's a moment for me, not New Year, but Christmas thinking... Here we are again, and I always think, how many more have I got left? Yep. And what did I do this year? And I start now really thinking about what happened, what I wish hadn't happened, mm -hmm. what I wish had happened. And that's what I mean about the sense of solitude that is allowed at this time, because you know, it is a, it is a festival of mystery as well, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and however ludicrous the Christmas story is, the, the Christian Christmas story, at the heart of it is a mystery, um, which is what, what, for me anyway, you know, is, is the magnet of the festival. Um, the idea that a miracle will take place, that it will not be convenient, because mm. miracles never are, and that that miracle will alter everything if you're prepared to see it or accept it. That's what I mean about the mystery of yeah. the Christmas story. 
And, it, you know, in, in, in the Christian Bible, it is very beautiful because it begins with a demand f uh, for money. You know, they're all going to have their taxes collected. Uh, and it's a census. It's really bureaucratic, <laughs> bean counting, boring stuff, which is the last thing anybody wants to do. And yet, how does it end? It ends with a gift, the gift of life, unto us a child is born. Yeah. So it, it, it moves straight away in that story from being about administration, about bureaucracy, about paying your taxes, about the whole thing being really dull, to the fact that suddenly there's this gift of life um, which will change everything. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to read that in, in the religious sense about here's Jesus. You need to read it actually um, in a very literal way. What is the gift that would change everything? What would it be for you in your life now? What, what would it be? that would change everything. And that's what I always come back to when I'm contemplating Christmas. Mm -hmm. And back to the awkward facts about miracles, that they never happen when you want them to. They're never convenient. They always disrupt everything. People always imagine they want a miracle, but do they? Mm -hmm. um, because it will not be the same again once the doors have blown off the stable and a M Michael Caine version <laughs> of the nativity. Um, What's left? I mean, you know, in the story, the three wise men, they have to go home by a different route because Herod's after them. But they are changed. Yeah. The shepherds are changed. What's happened to Mary and Jesus? Everybody is changed. And that, to me, is, 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 is the strange, mysterious heart of the story. It, it is about change. And it's about the responsibility that comes with change and the fact that when you do alter your life, everybody says, oh, do this, do that, and it'll all be fine. Do you know what? When you alter your life, it's the most difficult thing that you can do, and what comes after it is the most difficult thing. You know, Whether you're leaving somebody, getting together with somebody, changing it all, it doesn't suddenly come right, and you're in the sunny uplands. It's really hard. Mm. And that, too, is embedded in the story of Christmas, that this is a difficult journey, you know, a cold coming, the out of it. Just, just the, the worst, worst time, time of the year. Of the year. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's what it is. It's a difficult journey. It is to get anywhere that's worth getting to, mm. isn't it? Great. Jeanette, um, I thought I might ask you about, you know, Christmas meant a lot to you. And there was a particular moment that you write about in this book when you decided you were going to start marking the festival with stories. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, about what made you decide to... Like, I know that Joseph Brodsky, the Russian poet, Jewish Russian poet, thought to himself, I'm going to write a Christmas poem every year because he thought he had a responsibility to speak at large to a common ground yes. that people had. So what started you writing Christmas stories? Oh, to entertain myself. Um, I know writing is meant to be about suffering, but I've never mm. understood that. <laughs> um, one of the great things about sitting down to write something which is short, um, which by definition is a short story, is that you know you're going to get to the end quite soon and you will have a lot of fun on the way. And although they are demanding uh, in that you, know, you have to deliver in a short story in a way that you don't in a longer piece, um, there's also something very freeing and joyful about writing them. And it seemed to me perfect to do these things at Christmas where I could imagine scenarios that I wanted to explore, which is all I ever do, really. Mm. I always think, oh, what would happen if dot, 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 and then we go in there, um, whatever it is. And I kept writing them, and then I suddenly thought, you know what, I think you've got a book here um, by accident. And I did. And then I wanted to put the recipes in because for most of us, food is so important at Christmas, isn't it? Whatever it is, whether it's simple, humble, extravagant, elaborate, whether you've made it yourself or whether you bought it, it makes no difference. Everybody feels something about their Christmas meal hmm. or their lack of it. Actually, we're going to stop here. How many of you are going <coughs> to be having turkey in this audience? At oh, yeah, Christmas? turkey. Very, not, <coughs> not that many. Oh, no. How many of you are going to have a row? with your partners about what you're going to have for Christmas, or has that row already happened? Oh, looks what, like what it's, are you it's just then? me. If you know, are you all, OK, who's vegetarian? Still not enough, is it? No. Come on, then what are you having? <laughs> Venison. Capon. 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 Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? We've got venison, capon, turkey. Lamb. 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 Duck. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going out on the day? I mean, Ooh. either to relatives or to a restaurant. And who's cooking at home? 
There's a, oh, there's a lot of ladies there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, some things don't, there's not much mystery about that bit of Christmas, is there? Do you know what are you going to eat this Christmas? What is your... Well, I'm having two Christmases, which is greedy, but some friends of mine are getting married on the solstice down in Cornwall, and they normally come up for Christmas. I said, look, I'm taking the goose. Oh. So I've got a goose, so that's going down to Penzance. Um, and that will be just, I love a goose yeah. at Christmas. So that's then out, that's sort of our Christmas dinner and their, their wedding feast. As it were. There's only six of them, it's very small. And um, then I think at Christmas, it's going to have to be duck. But I've still got the sprouts in the garden. I see, wow. Which I have kept under a net to stop the pigeons getting them. So I feel pretty good about that. And I've got some <laughs> red cabbage and I've already got my potatoes in bags that I kept going, and I grow a lot of my own stuff. So it's going to be very personal. And in the morning, there'll be lovely champagne. Ah, yeah. And oh, in the I'm evening, there'll be more. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's how it's going to be. But it's also for me, on Christmas Eve, I don't know if you do this, I always listen um, on Radio 4 to the Festival of Carols and Nine Lessons, um, it, which, which started just after the First World War. And it's, it, it feels like one of the last remaining pieces of continuity. That in fact, the Tories haven't been able to destroy. <laughs> you know, they call themselves conservatives. There is nothing at all about these people um, that have conserved anything that mm. might be of value to this country or her peoples. Uh, it's shocking. But as yet, they haven't been able to do in the festival of, of carols and nine lessons coming from King's College, Cambridge, um, which I shall do. And I insist on being on my own for this. It doesn't matter whatever beloveds are. I have to do this on my own. So it starts at three o'clock. I get, get it all ready. I've baked my own bread. I've got lovely smoked salmon. I like to have black bread with you know, smoked salmon on the top because it's so pretty. Mm. And just to, for an hour and a half, just to listen yeah. to it. And be in that space as the light fails, which it does at that mm -hmm. hour, looking out onto the garden. Um, and, and for me, that, that actually is the moment of, of, of deepest reflection, I suppose. Because I think the church music and the readings, again, you don't have to believe it, but it allows your mind to occupy a different space. It's yeah. like going to the theatre yeah. or whatever it is. It's, you know, it simply takes you away from all the everyday detritus um, where we usually live, and which is actually so exhausting. Yeah, no, I agree. I, that yeah. language just coming into your life. Just coming in, yeah. yeah. That's and that's, right. that's what people do need. And it's hard for us now in the getting and spending world um, to find those times that we need for our mental health. And I do believe that people's mental health is suffering mm. because we are not getting those little oases, those oxygen cylinders, yeah. you know, those, those spaces that we had. Uh, just for yourself, just for a little while, just to get away from it uh, and let your mind run free. Um, and that's so important. I want to ask you one just quick question. I'm, and I'm going to yeah. read a couple of poems. And it's about, it's about writing food, writing about food. Yeah. Because, you know, I, 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 I use Delia Smith's, you know, kind of books for Christmas. And I always get to that point where it says, leave overnight. And I go, oh, no. Oh, no. Not again. <laughs> well, you've <laughs> not, got a dog. Not, not again. You can't leave anything <laughs> yeah, no. overnight. So, um, but you, it's a wonderfully kind of no-nonsense approach to leaving things out. And, do, and could you just talk about how you write about food in this book as opposed to how it's... It's embarrassing. Look, one of my dearest <laughs> friends is Nigella, and it's embarrassing. It frankly is embarrassing. And I did warn her, and I, kind of, I said, look, there's some recipes in here, just don't read those. Um, she was very gracious. <laughs> but, look, I'm a very practical person, partly because I think writing is practical. In the end, you've made something. If you haven't, you've failed, actually. Um, you need to make the bloody thing. Uh, like you need to make anything else that you want to make. Uh, mm. It takes time, it takes trouble, and then it's done. At which point you leave it. Um, not overnight, but you just leave it forever. You go when it's done. So for me, the, 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 for me cooking, is it's got to be delicious. I, I, I'm not a brilliant cook. Actually, I am quite good. But, <laughs> no, I am good, but I'm not fancy. I've had some partners who've been so, such fan... I mean, not just Nigella, but I've had fancy cooks in my life yeah. who were restaurant quality which I'm not. So I just get the simplest in ingredients, but the best ingredients. Mm. All local, all organic, um, meat from around where I live. And I cook it perfectly, and that's what you'll get on your plate. Mm. Um, but it is not fine dining at my house, though it is 
you know, delicious, mm. I hope. And so in this, I wanted to just use some recipes that were a part of my childhood, Mrs. Winston's mince pies, um, you know, you need cold hands for pastry in a cold house, which is no problem in the north of England. Um, I didn't have to put the pastry in the fridge, just leave it in the kitchen <laughs> for an hour, and it was absolutely <laughs> fine. Um, Dad's sherry trifle that he used to make with tins of, of Del Monte fruit cocktail. Mm. Uh, and it used to be called fruit cocktail because it had alcohol in, in it in the old days. Uh, mm. So he always used to make that himself, you know, with those awful Ritafia biscuits or whatever on the bottom. Things like that, silly things from the past, but also lovely things that I do now and think other people's recipes. There's a great recipe in here from our colleague Carmilla Shamsi, yeah. her turkey biryani, what to do with all that turkey the day after, um, recipes that she brought, brought back from her time in Karachi. Uh, fabulous. So there's something in there that everybody can do whatever your skill set, I think. I think that's right. It's got to be, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Cheese straws, the mince pies, anything. If you want to just cook quick, get this and copy it. Yeah. <laughs> and the whole effect of this um, light-filled house in the Cotswolds with a carvery effect and a yes. cook. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, very good. Well, don't buy it from the shops, because I don't know if you've been looking on the packets recently, but I, I've been having panic attacks, just thinking, what is in these things? You know, I mean, anybody can make a mince pie. It's like keeping a mm. goldfish. You know, why would you go out and buy one? I mean, it True. is quicker to make your own than to go to the shop. So just do it. Just do the old-fashioned recipe. None of this fancy stuff that all these Paul Hollywood things are in. Forget it. <laughs> forget it. It's pastry with mince meat in it. Just do it at home and forget the rest. Same with cheese straws. You don't need any emulsifiers or dextrose. No. Cheese, flour, water. It's all in the book. Grace. Egg. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, I had one other question for you, Teresa, about Christmas poems and carols. What are, they, like, you know, the, yes, the, of, the, of the lesson, of the, uh, of the nine lessons, is there one particular, car are, there, are there particular carols that you, aside from Mariah Carey? Apart, well, I know, I know. I, we should have had some proper carols, really, I suppose, shouldn't we? Yeah, I think it's, look, it's, it's got to be Christina Rossetti in the bleak oh, midwinter, it's something. hasn't it? Yeah. Um, and today in the Cotswolds, you look at snow has fallen, snow on snow, yeah. snow on snow on snow, and you think she was right yeah. in the bleak midwinter. Yeah. The earth stood hard as iron, water like a stone. They're, they're such simple images, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. But they are perfect. They are. And for a long time, we've forgotten what they mean. But now, with climate breakdown, we've, you know, summer's at 40 degrees and earth standing hard as iron and water like a stone. So when I hear those things, they're also calling us back, aren't they, down the, the, the line of time or with that connection that time is, suddenly seems very flimsy or really not relevant. So we're back in the 19th century, um, which is the, the, the big century of Christmas. You know, Prince Albert mm. invents it, brings over the Christmas tree for Victoria. She's delighted by everything he does. And then we get into it all, don't we? We get Christmas cards because we suddenly got a postal service. Um, we get the carols and these things that people can come together to join in and sing. It feels like um, a united nation, a shared mm country it wasn't but it, it felt like that and I can't rid myself and I don't think I want to of that feeling of connection you know with with the past and what this has meant to people for so long over such a such a period of time and again that's a mental health issue isn't it that we're not bobbing around on isolated rafts of time just here in the present we are connected mm -hmm. and that there is a rope flung across space that we can hold on to. Um, other people have felt this way. Other people have lived these lives, mm. have suffered as we do, have been happy as we do, um, have wanted to be loved, to be safe for their children, to be okay, to be warm, to be fed. It's such basic stuff. Yeah. And it hasn't gone away. Uh, and it's all wrapped up in the idea of Christmas that Charles Dickens did so well in A Christmas Carol. You know, who is in need? Who is in want? Who has things that they can give? Who has things that they need to be given to? Um, and for me, all of that, you know, is, is, is encapsulated in the carols, in the lessons. And so I am freed from the straitjacket of my own life and this moment into something much bigger than me. And that's a relief. Mm. True. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I'm going to read a poem which kind of relates a little bit to that, because there's something that poems can do, like those carols, which 
kind of fences you safely into um, places where it's okay to, and comfortable to be alone and to be lonesome. And it's one of the things mm. in the dark of winter um, that it's nice to know you had company there in the past or people who felt the same way um, as you might do. Um, the poem I'm going to read is by Thomas Hardy and it's called The Oxen. Do any of you know Thomas Hardy's poems? Some of you, a few nodding heads. And The Oxen is a really, really beautiful um, uh, poem of his. And I, I was thinking about it lately because I was reading it, a, an autobiographical piece by a writer from the same part of, world, of the world as I'm from, John Moriarty, who was, um, he was, a, he was a sort of a Christian writer, really, a, and a philosopher. But he had this amazing story about his first experience of doubt. And he said he loved Christmas. He said everybody was in the house for once. They gathered around the fire in Tarbert in North Kerry. And... Um, he just felt like the whole world was on fire. The story of the nativity was there. They had a crib. Um, the fire was burning. Everybody was warm. Everybody knew the story. Everybody felt at home in it. Mm. And then they had the animals in the crib, and they had the baby Jesus had arrived into the crib. And he said then his mother said, will you go out there and just check on the cattle and make sure that there's straw in the byre? So he went out, and he checked in, and he looked in at the actual cows outside, and he had this moment of absolute loss when he realized that these cows didn't know about Jesus. And he, was, and he was seven years old, and he thought he was going back into the warmth of the world, and it was just a dream, and it didn't exist in the world around him. I thought it was such an amazing... I, anyway, I felt it <laughs> yes. very deeply. And then it reminded me, though, of this Thomas Hardy poem. And Thomas Hardy is a poet of winter, like just an utterly, unbelievably mm. wonderful poet of ice and frost and and stone and, and gray, grays as well. So this poem is called The Oxen. Um, Christmas Eve and 12 of the clock. Now they are all on their knees, an elder said, as we sat in a flock by the embers in heartside ease. We pictured the meek, mild creatures where they dwelt in their strawy pen, nor did occur to one of us there to doubt they were kneeling then. So fair a fancy few would weave in these years. Yet I feel if someone said on Christmas Eve, come, see the oxen kneel in the lonely barton by yonder coom our childhood used to know, I should go with him in the gloom, hoping it might be so. so okay, beautiful, beautiful poem. Beautiful poem. So yeah. hoping it might be so. Hoping it might be so. Or Anybody hoping it might be so this Christmas? <laughs> so I, I think I might actually just maybe stop now, Jeanette, and I might ask you um, to maybe read us a story. Sure, okay. I will. We were discussing which one I was going to read earlier, and John wanted a scary one, but I'm not I doing did. that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go and sit at All the right. front here as well to, to listen. I thought we might have a cheery one instead. Ah. Oh. Now, oh, is this light going to be all right? Do you know what? I'm going to have to get my specs. Where's Mariah Carey? I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Sing a song. Yeah, I just need a brighter light on the page. Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, yeah, that's lovely, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> I won't make you famous enough. No. An interval is what we need. Really Do we like white Christmas? Yeah. What's your favourite? Anything. Favourite Christmas song? Silent Night. Silent Night. 
Yeah, Holy Night. What else? Good King Wenceslas. Good King Wenceslas. No Mariah Carey then. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sometimes I, I well, actually, if if I were not a human being, I'm not entirely sure I am one, but if I were not one, nominally, I would be. If I were a dog, I would be a terrier. There is no question of this. So I was thinking to myself, I'll write a story about a dog, a terrier, uh, called, and it's called Christmas Cracker. Christmas Eve at the Cracker Factory. Boxes labelled trumpets, drums, stars, robins, snowmen were stacked on either side of the long tables where the crackers were assembled. Sheets of gold cardboard were piled against the cutting machines. Waterfalls of red streamers ran down the walls. The spitting, snapping, banging, firing, pistol shot strips that made the crackers crack were stored safely in tubes on the shelves. Three Giant vats of the Alibaba kind were marked hats, jokes, balloons, and these sat under the funnels that automatically topped them up as more and more crackers were filled, packed and dispatched. The cracker factory operated all year round, but at Christmas time, everybody worked harder to fulfil the orders. Cheap crackers, economy crackers, family packs, deluxe boxes, sets for children, sets for grown-ups, and some boxes marked adult, because they contained very tiny briefs. <laughs> Most of the crackers had long since been dispatched to the stores and from stores to tables as everyone made ready for Christmas Day. But there was one cracker left to be made. The very last, the very special, the giant charity Christmas cracker, long as a crocodile, fat as a pudding, an enormous golden tube lying on its side waiting to be stuffed tight as a sausage. But for now, the factory's empty because it's early morning and the bus is just arriving at the gates and Bill and Fred and Amy and Belle are coming in, special shift, cheerful because it's Christmas now and they'll have a drink when it's done. The factory's empty, is it? The dog is still asleep in a dream of warm tissue paper. That's where he crept last night, cold and wet, because somebody left open a small window and he's only a small dog. In he crept, under the red safety light that shone on the gold card beneath the paper angels. And he rolled on his back to get dry, and he ate a marzipan donkey. Bad for his teeth, but what can you do? And he fell asleep. In they come, neon lights, radio on, and before the dog can say woof, a golden tunnel opens right before his brown eyes and a pair of firm, spade-like hands shove all the tissue paper and all the dog right inside one end of the cracker. And it's sealed with a plastic lid. He can still see out the other end. So he buries his nose deeper, the hair in his ears twitching as an avalanche of chocolate crashes around his head, followed by an army of teddy bears, an arsenal of pop guns, a barrage of balloons, beads like hailstones, a string of yo-yos, a peal of whistles, a masked ball of false noses and beards, and a plague of clockwork mice, and a huddle of evil-looking finger puppets dressed in black. And somebody says, make it good with the explosives then, this one's got to go with a bang. And a fuse rod of gunpowdery stuff is poked past the dog's nose, <sniffs> sneeze, and past his tail, twitch, and out through a hole in the lid. And the dog thinks of all those circus animals fired out of cannons, or the ones dropped by parachute behind enemy lines. He thinks of Laka, the Soviet dog, shot into space, never to come down. And he thinks of the star dogs, Canis Major and Minor tracking the dark fields above, glittering guardians of their rougher kind below. Perhaps he's going to join them, sky set, a new burned star, Canis Fugit, the flying dog. But he doesn't want to be a flying dog. He wants all four paws on the ground. Too late! They're tying the ribbon at both ends round the giant charity cracker and he feels himself lifted up and carried out like a canine Cleopatra in a roll of carpet. 
And there he is on a gilded barge. No, no, it's the back of a battered truck driving towards a large hotel with a green-coated doorman at the door and a white Christmas tree just behind the door in the chandeliered lobby. The dog and his cracker are carried in by specially chosen elves on the minimum wage. This is the children's charity party. Rich parents have paid a lot so that their children can help children in need without having to meet any of them. The dog can hear announcements being made, special prizes, and the best prize of all is for the one who wins the cracker. The dog is worried about what will happen when they find him wrapped up inside. He isn't anybody's idea of a free gift, not anyone's idea of a gift at all. He's a stray. He knows no one will want him. He lives in the park and he drinks from the fountain. He came with the fair when he was a puppy and he ran round the rides in his crisscross mongrel colours. And then one day the fair packed up and the caravans pulled away one by one and he went to sleep for a bit because he didn't know what was happening. And when he woke up, everybody had gone. He ran, sniffing after them at first, following the scent of diesel and hot dogs. But his paws were slower than their wheels and though he ran and ran till his pads were raw, at night time he had to give up and limping and frightened through the dark and the noise, he found his way back to the park, cold dog. He was glad of the rustle of the trees and the soft leaves. Sometimes people feed him sandwiches, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they try to catch him. He knows the sound of the van and he runs down the street where he can slither under a gate till they've gone. And sometimes a human sleeps in the park too and makes a fuss of him. But humans move on. You can't rely on people. He knows that. Last night was very cold. He was out, scavenging for food. The kebab man has gone back to Turkey for Christmas. The dog likes kebabs. He sniffed a bit around the bins, but the streets had all been clean. As he trotted down the road, keeping to the wall, he saw a window that was ajar and the red light inside. It looked warm and the rain had turned to sleet. But now, what will happen when they find him in the cracker? He can hear a lot of noise. He'll keep quiet. The hotel ballroom is crammed with children waving raffle tickets, and it's time for the prizes to be given away. Dolls, games, toy guitars, remote control cars. And there's a man in a spangly jacket with a microphone. He's on stage and he wants all the children to sing jingle bells. And then it's time, the big one, the cracker, the elves push it onto the stage. What's the winning number? Yes, it's 999. Two children rush forward, a fat boy in a red Elvis suit and a slim girl in a fake fur coat. Has there been a mistake? There are two winning tickets. The children glare at each other and take up combat positions at either end of the cracker. And the room fills with feral energy as the kids in the room take sides. Pull, pull, pull. The boy wraps his hands around one end and the girl digs her heels in and just holds on, like she's seen her mother do in the sails. <laughs> but then a quiet, pale boy comes forward and he gives the master of ceremonies his ticket. He's got 999 too. The master of ceremonies scratches his wig well, whatever's inside this bumper, giant, gigantically exciting cracker, you'll just have to share. But the children in the ballroom start to boo. Sharing is for losers, says the girl. It's Christmas, says the master of ceremonies, as though repeating the obvious will make the unexpected happen. The pale, quiet boy stands back while the boy in the red suit turns redder than his suit as he pulls and pulls at the end of the cracker and the girl throws her whole body weight on top of the cracker to stop her new enemy winning the bang. The pale, quiet boy standing in the middle holding his ticket wonders why he can see a paw <laughs> beginning to poke through the rip. Bang! Then it goes, like somebody split the atom, and up in the air is a mushroom cloud made of chocolate and yo-yos and false noses and finger puppets. 
And for a second, it hangs in perfect space. And then, as the contents of the cracker scatter over the ballroom, it's every child for himself, fighting over silver coins and plastic spiders. And nobody notices that free-falling through the smoky, acrid air is a small terrier with a paper hat round his neck. Where's the big present? asked the boy. I want the cracker! I want the big present! The dog lands at his feet. What's that dog doing in the cracker? asked the girl. The dog is used to being chased and shouted at, but this time he knows he's in trouble. And so he thinks on his feet, all four feet, as fast as his doggy brain can, and he says, Hi, I'm a magic dog, like the genie in the bottle. Woof, woof. What genie? What bottle? says the boy, suspicious that he's missing something. Who stole my genie? If you're a magic dog, yeah, right. Where are my three wishes? says the girl. And the pale, quiet boy says nothing. He's looking at the dog. OK, OK, OK. One wish each, says the dog, pointing at the children with his snouty nose. One, two, three. Your wish is my command. Woof. I want a Ferrari, says the boy. Righto, says the dog. Give me ten minutes. And the dog dives under a long tablecloth and races to the end of the ballroom. He's thinking only of escape. He skids across the polished floor, over the carpet, past the cloakroom, sees the zigzag sign for the emergency stairs and reckons that must be for him. This is an emergency. Go, dog, go. He helter-skelters down the narrow concrete stairs and lands on his head in the underground car park. Move that Ferrari in Bay 16, will you? Shouts the valet, winging the keys through the air towards his assistant. And it must be said that for all our planning and plotting and deliberating and deciding, the moment that changes everything comes when it will. And it cannot be coaxed or invoked and it should not be missed. The dog didn't miss. He stood on his hind paws and he leapt. He leapt out of his scraggy, raggy tooth and nail past and he caught the future as it whipped by his jaws. And there he is, back up the whirl of the concrete stairs, through the emergency exit, past the cloakroom, into the ballroom, just escaping concussion from a hundred yo-yos. But with one bound, he's on the stage by the remains of the exploded cracker and there are the car keys at the feet of the boy in the Elvis suit. <coughs> Underground parking bay 16, says the dog. The boy's eyes gleam with greedy happiness. He doesn't bother to thank the dog. He just grabs the keys in his fist and waddles off, showing the smaller children, shoving the smaller children out of his way. Me now, says the thin girl. Me, me, me. I want a fur coat. That's unethical replies the dog, who has never heard the word before, but finds it on the tip of his pink tongue. I want one, shrieks the girl, with such force that all the glass baubles on the Christmas tree shatter to powder. OK, says the dog, your wish is my command. And he's about to turn tail, but the pale little boy has knelt down and given him a drink of water and a ham sandwich from which he has carefully removed the lettuce. The dog is grateful, and he hopes that whatever happens... He can bring this little boy his wish. But first there's the matter of the fur coat. And he's lucky because the parents are arriving to collect their children just at the moment when gentle tinsel snow begins to fall in the bar next to the ballroom. Wouldn't a drink be nice? And what's five minutes in a lifetime, especially at Christmas? But these are the minutes some good angel has earmarked for the dog who can't believe his soft brown eyes as coat after coat is passed over to the girls working in the padded cloakroom. And if he just sits quietly and just waits, yes, it's a mink! The girls are busy hanging up the coats in the pile and chatting about the best value turkeys, so they never notice the mink silently sliding away under the counter and across the floor, the dog underneath it, 20 times his size, but he's a terrier and born with the holy law of the jaw. Don't let go. Darling, there's a coat. There's a coat running across the floor on its own. This is one very drunk man to his very sober wife. She doesn't even look round. Don't be silly, darling. 
And so the sleek mink coat piloted by the rough-coated dog makes its way across the carpet into the ballroom and towards the bottom of the steps of the stage. There's a muffled woof. The girl is on her mobile phone and doesn't notice that her heart's desire has arrived. The pale little boy has been waiting, really a bit anxious about the magic dog. And when he sees the coat, like a rug on centipede legs, slinking across the floor, he knows the dog must be underneath and he runs to pull him out. You all right, says the boy. A bit hot, says the dog. <laughs> Tell her the coat's here. The girl covers her face in her hands and then starts clapping the way she's seen winners do on TV talent shows. She pulls on the coat and sashes off the stage and falls flat on her face, just as the master of ceremonies reappears with a microphone in his hand. He looks grim. He looks serious. It seems that the winning ticket, 999, has not been multiplied by three after all. It wasn't the Christmas elves, it was two felt-tip pens. The holders of ticket numbers 9 and 99 each added the required nines to their stock. The big present will go to the real number, 999. The pale little boy still has his ticket in his hand and the master of ceremonies examines it through a magnifying glass. Yes, it's the one. And the organ strikes up jingle bells, but not loud enough to drown out the terrific crash in the hotel lobby. And everyone runs to the doors to see a red Ferrari driven by a red-faced boy in a red suit, shatter in plate glass with the white Christmas tree jammed through the sunroof and the green doorman sprawled over the bonnet. The dog made me do it, screams the boy as the security guards drag him out. The girl in the fur coat is laughing so much she can hardly hold her phone still enough to take the snap to send to all her friends. And as she holds both hands above her head, a pair of handcuffs slots neatly around her wrist. The girl has just stole my coat, she's wearing it. The Russian model is unhappy. I am friend of Putin. <laughs> the dog gave it to me, wails the girl. Arrest the dog! But the dog is nowhere to be seen. And the dog has crept behind the blow-up reindeer in the ballroom, and he's not coming out. As the row in the hotel lobby reaches custard pie proportions, the master of ceremonies takes the pale, quiet boy to a gold box with a red ribbon, and he says, go on, open it. Hesitatingly, the boy pulls the ribbon because he isn't used to big presents. Him and his mum don't have much money. Inside the box is a mountain bike. And it's all yours, says the master of ceremonies. You won it, fair and square. Left alone with the bike, the boy runs his hands over the clean cogs and smooth gears, the lightweight frame and the drop raised handlebars. It's the best bike in the world. Well, woof, you won't be needing a wish then, says the dog, invisibly from behind the blow-up reindeer. Probably for the best under the circumstances. Another shriek comes from the hotel lobby as the Ferrari owner is reunited with the remains of his car. He's shouting something about a golf course and Donald Trump. The boy sits on the edge of the stage, swinging his thin legs and looking at the dog's eyes, looking at him. He holds out another sandwich. The dog's brown eyes dart left and right. And then he trots out and he takes the sandwich and he sits next to the boy. I'm not a magic dog. <laughs> I'm a stray. I got trapped in the cracker. It was so cold last night, I usually sleep under the wheelie bins in the park, but they'd taken them away and I was shivering. So I went for a walk to get warm and I saw a light in a window and I found a bench full of coloured paper and I fell asleep and here I am. I came on the bus, said the boy. I live with my mum. She claims at the hotel, so they have to invite us to the party. What were you going to wish for? said the dog, if I had been a magic dog. And the boy thought for a bit because he was that kind of boy. And then he said, if I had a wish, it would be to take you home with me and keep you forever. What? But the dog, his ears going round and round like satellite dishes picking up an alien signal. What? Woof, what, woof, what, woof? I wish for you said the boy, my name's Tommy. What's your name? I've got one. 
I'll call you Magic, said Tommy. And Tommy asked his mother if he could take Magic home, and she said yes. He could keep the dog as long as he knew that a dog is forever, and not just for Christmas. And that was all right, because Tommy was a forever sort of boy. And then Tommy and Magic ran round and round. They helped Tommy's mum to collect the streamers and the burst balloons and all the things that Christmas leaves behind. And they were happy because they weren't leaving each other behind. And at last, Tommy's mother finished work and off they went, all three, into the frosty streets to the bus stop. And the dog trotted beside the boy and looked into the clear sky at the star dogs, cold and fine. And he knew that whatever you wish, you can't wish for better than love. Well, you can't be too sentimental at Christmas, can you? You see, that's what I mean. That's what you're allowed to do. You just think, the lot. <laughs> Children, dogs, greed, happy endings. Who wouldn't want to write a Christmas story? When you get home tonight, you know what to do. <laughs> that was wonderful, Denise. And you're such an absolute shocker to bring all the feelings out at the end after all Sorry. the comedy. <laughs> really putting, putting that poor stray in. <laughs> Look at people rubbing their eyes down there. <laughs> um, we have just a few minutes if anybody would like to, to add something to the mix. And we have lots of good friends. And they're always really talkative in the audience here tonight. So usually. So who'd like to, who'd like to maybe talk about uh, Christmas plans or a favorite carol? Or I might have a question for Jeanette. We have a, a man here in the front row. There's, a, there's actually a, a microphone coming towards you because we have our, 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 our live stream audience as well, so they'll hear you too. Uh, um, I was saying to John, John um, that he stole my question because I was going to ask you what your favorite Grinch. Grinch stole the question. <laughs> yeah. See, I knew there was one that oh, somewhere. Dear. Dear, oh dear. <laughs> but so I, because I was going to ask you, I was thinking, well, what would I say if you asked me? So I thought, good King Wenceslas. And then I thought, you know, you were talking about Christmas's past. For years and years, I always used to think it was good King Wenceslas. So it was Chund, uh, last looked out. So I assumed it was a. Uh, the last night of his life. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> ah. And that stuck with me until suddenly, I don't know why, maybe it came on uh, as a subtitle. And then you thought, what's this old bloke doing on the night he's going to die, walking yeah. in the snow? <laughs> you know. Exactly. Stop so, in. That was quite a scary, scary carol. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There are ghost stories that would fit that theme in the yeah. book. No, I, sure. tot I totally understand that because it used to be the same with We, Th we Three Kings. Yeah, We Three Kings of Orient R. I used to think, where is Orient R? <laughs> you know, there was some place, you know, you could have Orient R, S, T, and onwards. It's to do with the lights in Orient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think I'll go with Hannah. Yeah, and that was always the best thing with it, for, you know, Fear Not City for Mighty Dread. I always thought Mighty Dread as this huge kind of monster alien. Fear Not City for Mighty Dread had seized their troubled minds. And you think, get off, Mighty <laughs> Dread, smash it, you know, Marvel comic stuff. Um, I always like wearing Christmas jumpers and things like that. Why haven't you got one on then? I know, I feel disappointed, but I just wanted to pay tribute to the young woman that I'm sitting next to here. <laughs> Who has oh Santa God. hat, Santa scarf? Yeah, I've got even more. What have I you got? Come on, <laughs> display yourself. <laughs> Look at this. Every layer. Stand up here so that. Stand oh. up here. Come oh. on. Oh. A round of applause. <laughs> Woo! I, I, I think we have to have that. There's true a jump. Manchester. You're going to have to come, come up on, and show everybody. Come on, more everybody. jumpers. We have another here with with actually oh, yes. with, with flashing lights. Oh, sorry, I missed you can this. Have a, oh, come yeah. on. We'll have a face-off now. Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got special clothes for Christmas that they wear that they would never take out any other time of the year? You've got something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have by tomorrow. Now you've been inspired. Very good. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I think we'll... It's not going to be the same, though, is it, with no Queen's speech this year? I don't know what to do about that. Charles going to speak. I suppose he is, but it won't be the same. No. Mm. no. Um, speech on Channel 4 every year. 
Is there? I oh, don't know. Oh, no. I just want the well, Queen I back. Oh, did he? That's yeah. probably all right. Alternative yeah. Channel 4? Yeah, alternative speech. Yeah. I was hoping that she'd last until she'd recorded it, and then we could have had the ghost speech as well. <laughs> well, she could have recorded it before she died. She could. She probably did, actually. Mm. There might be one. They usually do it in August at Balmoral, don't they? Exactly, Dress yeah. it all up to look like Christmas. Yeah, yeah probably right. it's probably there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There they show it. Yeah. What? <laughs> What's left? Queen's gone. Uh. <sighs> Tories are still in power. Never mind, that's not Christmassy. Uh. We need to end on a good note if we're not having Mariah Carey. I think we can manage it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what so. I will say is, though, there is one thing that Christmas... I think Christmas is a very good time to forgive people. Mm. Um, so if anybody here either needs to forgive or needs to be forgiven, don't curl up and die and think, I hate her, I'm never coming again. <laughs> it's your opportunity. Um, and it's a good moment, because sometimes we need... We could do with a headwind uh, instead of always having to struggle ourselves. And you can use these festivals because you, there's a kind of community energy that's going on, something bigger. You don't have to generate everything yourself, like pedalling just to power a light bulb. There's a different energy. So if there's something you need to do that involves another person, use the energy of the season um, and give it a try. And if you fail, it doesn't matter because you did your best. Yes, Karen. There's a mic coming to you. Oh, yeah. Sorry. yeah, I just want to say how much I enjoyed your storytelling. It's telling your own story. Would you consider making, I don't know, audio of all your stories? There is an audio book of Christmas days. I do the, I do the, the recipes and the sections, and um, I don't know who, who's reading it. Somebody knows who's reading it. Is it Imogen Church reads the stories? Yeah, um, so they're, they're in there, but I didn't want to do the whole thing. I wanted to pop in and out. I like, po I like popping in and out. I've got a Gemini moon. I like to just get, <laughs> get in and out in the gaps, if possible. Very good. Well, can you join me in thanking Jeunesse? for traveling up <laughs> against the odds. Yesterday, we were having a lot of chat about how we might do this. Oh, yeah, I didn't want to do it on to Zoom. I was determined <laughs> if it was possible to get here, yeah. um, to get here. Um, and I am, and no, no way could be better to be here tonight. <laughs> and, and thank you all for coming out. The conditions aren't great here either, and it's wonderful to see such a big crowd coming out in December. It always feels like a little bit of a risk to run an event here, but um, so thank you all as well. And I think we get to say, Happy, ha do we? Ha do, I think, uh, is it too early? I think no, we can say it. No, let's start yeah. now. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wish it to your neighbor. Uh, yeah. Merry Christmas, Merry one Christmas. and all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Judy Garland now. <laughs>